With 2025 rapidly coming to a close, many important milestones still lay ahead of the Starship program leading into 2026. Almost a month has already passed since Booster 18's mishap at Massey's, and recovering from that has remained of the utmost importance. All while SpaceX is making progress at an unbelievable rate towards completing the next vehicle in line, Booster 19. Also, there are still a lot of questions remaining unanswered regarding timelines for vehicle and pad readiness ahead of version 3's debut, which could be here sooner than we think. I'm Max Evans for NSF, and as always, we have all of that to talk about and more on this holiday episode of Starbase Update. In recent episodes, we've mentioned that one of the keys to Starship's next flight is to finish stacking Booster 19 and moving it out to Massey's for testing as soon as possible. SpaceX wants to minimize the time on impacts from Booster 18's failure as much as possible, and for that reason, they've set out to finish Booster 19 by the end of the month. And last week, we pointed out that progress so far has been on track based on the sections that we've seen moved and welded to this point. Just last week, Booster 19 consisted only of its liquid oxygen tank, but that simply isn't the case anymore. We mentioned that before the welding of the booster's engine section, SpaceX installed the first two landing tanks and the massive transfer tube through the LOX tank itself. That necessitates a jig that carries the tank from Star Factory into Mega Bay 1 and aids in its installation. And as it turns out, we saw it moving out of Mega Bay 1 and back into Star Factory, confirming that Booster 19's LOX tank had already been welded into the engine section, which was then followed by a methane tank barrel section, which we saw roll into Mega Bay 1 on the same day. And they just kind of kept coming because the booster's Thor dome section with its integrated hot staging ring was also rolled out the next day. <laughs> Deep breath here, because it's a lot to keep up with. And I say that just because this weekend, the last of the methane tank's barrel sections were also seen rolling into Mega Bay 1. Now, all of this is to say that just one month after Booster 18's failure, all required barrel sections for Booster 19 were rolled out and stacked, just as SpaceX aimed for. To put this in perspective, it took 42 days for SpaceX to roll all of Booster 17's barrel sections, and that was the last version 1 booster, mind you. So they already had plenty of experience by then. But 19 has only taken about half the time at 25 days between the first barrel section going in back on November 25th and this last one going in on December 20th. Now, once the top of 19 is complete, it'll be removed from the front right turntable and welded onto its lower half, completing the stacking process. That may not be visible due to that pesky mega bay door, but we know that it involves changing bridge cranes inside. To do that, SpaceX normally has to roll a ring inside and the methane tank is lifted out of the welding turntable and lowered onto the stand. It's then picked up by the other bridge crane, lifting it up and placing it over the rest of the booster to complete the stack. Seeing that ring stand will serve as our biggest clue that a fully stacked booster is upon us. We're not entirely sure when that might happen, but by the time this video goes live, there should only be about 9 days left in the month, which is plenty of time to do all that. I guess kind of TLDR, we're only two welds away from a fully stacked super heavy booster, so nine days seems like plenty of time to finish it. The big question, however, is how long it will take for SpaceX to ready Booster 19 for cryogenic proof testing once it's fully stacked. After all, completing the structure of the vehicle doesn't guarantee readiness for its testing campaigns just yet. So we'll have to wait and see what the coming weeks bring. And now that's just on the booster side of the equation. We also had to talk about Ship 39, Booster 19's pairing for Flight 12. At the moment, at least at the time of recording, it's still inside Mega Bay 2. However, SpaceX has other methods of verifying version 3 ship design before flight in the meantime, including the likes of, you probably already guessed it, the various test tanks throughout Starbase. So far, we've only seen one version 3 ship test tank, S39.1, and that actually may not be the case for much longer, but more on that later. This test tank is meant to verify the new engine section, which has been redesigned for version 3. S39.1 was tested on the ship thrust simulator stand three times earlier this month, having been loaded with cryogenic fluids on all three occasions. This past week, teams at the Massey Outpost removed the test tank from the thrust simulator stand and rolled the stand itself back to Sanchez, where it is currently residing at the time of this recording. We don't know whether SpaceX has anything else planned for this test tank. Either more testing or its own campaign is now complete. Now, with that out of the way, we're still wondering when Ship 39 itself will be making the trek out to Massey's for testing of its own. Usually, newly built ships are placed on the same thrust simulator stand as mentioned before, 
and they undergo cryogenic proof testing while being subjected to forces simulating the loads from Raptor engines during flight. Now, one of the more interesting things of note this week was that SpaceX seemed to be changing out all of the COPVs from inside Ship 39, or composite overwrap pressure vessels. We spotted a few stages near Mega Bay 2, and a crane has been periodically lifting and lowering hardware for some time now. A COPV was deemed at fault for Ship 36's explosion back in June. Since then, SpaceX has implemented measures to prevent that sort of failure from happening again, which could have been related to how they were handled during transport or in early vehicle production phases. While it's not confirmed that Booster 18's failure was because of COPVs, the rupture of its LOX tank was suspiciously close to where they were stored in the shines. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any information here from SpaceX other than they were performing a gas system test at the time of the anomaly. So, as mentioned, there's no confirmation that the failure was caused from COPVs. But given how recent that was, it's kind of difficult to not mentally make that connection given what we see now with Ship 39. Now, it's worth mentioning that this could be totally unrelated, but we simply don't have the full info on that yet, and I'm not sure we ever will. But in either case here, the COPV swap gives the impression that there was more work left to be done than we perhaps would have expected at this point, considering it was fully stacked over a month ago now. Whenever its cryo testing is complete, it'll go back into Mega Bay 2 to receive its Raptor engines for the first engine test campaign of a version 3 ship. This should take place at Massey's recently upgraded ship static fire area. We talked last week about how SpaceX was putting together a new truss structure, which may potentially aid in accessing critical parts of the vehicle. Well, this week, we began to see some of the new truss structure being lifted into place here. It'll be interesting to see whether or not this structure will be needed to carry out Ship 39's engine testing campaign, of course, once it's ready. Now, to add into the uncertainty of what's coming next ahead of Flight 12, as of a few days ago, Ship 39 is no longer alone in Mega Bay 2. On December 18th, a four-ring barrel section was moved into Mega Bay 2 and was lifted onto the turntable, indicating this barrel section was about to be welded onto another component. What's curious about this is that the barrel section was rather random and it doesn't really appear like it has anything to do with a production vehicle. In fact, it almost looks like SpaceX is putting together another test tank. If that's the case, it could be one oriented for ship testing, but it's unclear which part of the ship it's meant to simulate exactly. As always, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But regardless, this adds a twist into the whole equation because now it's like, it's a brand new test tank. And we're pretty far into the Flight 12 campaign already, which means SpaceX would have to finish building and testing it prior to flight, right? To add to all of this, SpaceX also tested the B18.1 test tank at Massey's this week for the first time since September. This test tank represents the newly designed booster aft section, and it's sitting inside of the structural test stand at Massey's. It seemed like it suffered a failure of sorts back in September, and since then, teams haven't been working on it whatsoever. All this to say that they are not finished with the test tanks, even on the booster side. Alongside B18.1 is the B18.3 test tank, which is meant to test the forward section of the version 3 booster design. And honestly, we haven't seen any other tests performed here since the one we talked about last week, but that could change at any point. So to this point, to recap, we've looked at all the Flight 12 vehicles and their test tanks. But how are all the other vehicles doing? Well, not great, but not terrible. Let me explain. While we've seen progress on the various ship nose cones visible throughout the Star Factory windows, the problem here is that the progress is slower than compared to a month or two ago. It really makes us wonder whether SpaceX is really concentrating on current vehicles and slowing down on work with future ships. Or perhaps this could be stemming from a lack of visibility into the hardware stored inside Star Factory. But honestly, for all we know, there might be massive progress on future ships, but around different areas of the vehicle, like the payload bay sections, tanks, or the aft end. After all, only the nose cone itself is visible, so there's really no way to tell if other sections of the vehicles are coming along as much. It's clear, however, that SpaceX doesn't really seem to be in a hurry to move Ship 40 into Mega Bay 2 and begin stacking, even though they probably could have started that a while ago. This week also saw a delivery of two aerodynamic flaps for a ship to the production site, so maybe those will be put to use sooner than later. And speaking of ships here, we should mention an old friend of sorts. SpaceX moved Ship 33's payload bay barrel section from the Star Factory into the scrapyard this week. Now remember, we are referring to the original Ship 33 vehicle here, which was originally designed to be a version 1 ship. SpaceX kept this payload bay section inside Star Factory for a while, and we're not exactly quite sure why. A few weeks ago, we had mentioned that it had been stripped of its heat shield tiles, so now seeing it move to the scrapyard is kind of expected at this point, and honestly, good riddance. 
Let's change gears a bit from vehicles and test tanks and onto the launch site, starting with Pad 1 demolition. While only two months have passed since Starship's last flight, demolition here is moving along pretty rapidly. In the last week, teams have concentrated their efforts on removing the three large water tanks that were part of Pad 1's deluge system. These tanks were removed one by one and then rolled from Starbase to the port of Brownsville. What SpaceX exactly has in mind for these is unknown, but just like with the other tanks we talked about last week, they'll either decide to reuse them somewhere else, like here on the Space Coast, or they'll scrap them or sell them off. Apart from the large deluge tanks, SpaceX has also removed the carbon dioxide tank that was next to the deluge tank farm. This tank served as storage to hold said carbon dioxide used for the fire suppression system for Starship version 1 and version 2. Now, you might put your hand up here and go, hang on, why are they taking away all of this seemingly substantial hardware from Pad 1 and having it sent all away? Couldn't they just keep it and reuse it as part of the new pad design? And while that is a great question, the matter of fact here is that the whole area where the Pad 1 deluge farm is located will be extended and the system itself will be upgraded to match that of Pad 2. So even if they wanted to reuse hardware here, they still have to be removed so SpaceX can work here and make it suitable for the new hardware. Now, all of that has been happening on the backside of Tower 1. In front of the tower, crews have been removing huge chunks of the water-cooled steel plate that was located under the launch mount. Our field team in Starbase was able to spot trucks loaded with these bits of steel, ready to have them sent away. Meanwhile, crews continued work on Pad 2, preparing it for its first booster static fire and launch. Rather importantly, the ship quick disconnect arm has been receiving a great deal of attention where it connects to Pad 2's tower. Its forearm, if you will, or the part that actually reaches out to ship, remains at the Sanchez lot, but has finally received its umbilical plate that interfaces and connects to ships themselves. We may just be weeks away from seeing it ready for rollout and installation on Pad 2, so keep your eyes peeled on Starbase Live for that. We've also seen more of the launch mount hold down arms protection hoods this week. There should be about 20 of these to be installed, so we may still have some more heading this way. Just as we had talked about last week, the launch mount is still crowded with scaffolding and it remains a mystery as to when we'll see further testing such as the top deck deluge system. On a similar note to that, we observed Pad 2's side of the tank farm being tested again this week though, which feels sort of reassuring since that should lead to fewer troubles once there are actual vehicles at the pad, either for testing or for launch. Pad 2's chopstick system has also seen a great deal of progress itself. A few weeks ago, we mentioned that SpaceX had removed its hydraulic actuators. These allow the arms to open and close, so of course it seemed a little strange that SpaceX decided to remove them since they may need to be used rather soon? Question mark? Thankfully though, we can stop worrying about that because this week at least one of the arms, in this case the west side, received a brand new hydraulic actuator. This one appears to be wider than those installed previously, so maybe they have potential to move even faster now, which is kind of scary because they're already freaking huge. Near the launch site, SpaceX is also working on the air separation unit, or ASU, located near the beach. Since our last update, teams have installed the motors for the two multi-stage compressors that will be in use in this facility. These compressors are in charge of taking the air that will be then distilled and separated into nitrogen, oxygen, and argon for SpaceX to use out here for various purposes. This site will be key in helping to ramp up launch cadence in the future here, as SpaceX will need a lot of nitrogen and lots of oxygen to feed Starship. Now, Starbase isn't the only spaceport that SpaceX aims to install an ASU at. Here in the Space Coast, SpaceX is planning to build one for Launch Complex 39A and another at Space Launch Complex 37. This week, the St. Johns River Water Management District released documents pertaining to the development of three parcels south of Space Launch Complex 37, one of which will contain the future ASU for this site. These are actually surrounding the existing horizontal integration facility, which is still in use by ULA to store hardware for Vulcan and Atlas V. One of these documents is a drainage report made by an external company for SpaceX, and it contains a map showing exactly where the ASU will be, which should be to the southeast of the ULA hangar, and it appears that it will also include drainage ponds to the north of the parcel. The fact that SpaceX is already doing all of this paperwork is leading us to think that the ASU might be in place at around the same time that the pad becomes active, if not soon after. Meanwhile, at Launch Complex 39A, this past week, we've seen the installation of the traveling block on the chopstick carriage system. This is one of the key parts of the system that will allow the chopsticks to move up and down the tower. For now, it doesn't look like the whole pulley system has been threaded by a wire yet, but that could come up in the coming weeks. 
Back in Starbase, we've seen more progress on Gigabay construction. In the ever-changing Starbase skyline, the four tower cranes and the gray steel of Gigabay are beginning to dominate the view of the production site. Since our last episode, teams have almost completed its second level, thus now making it actually taller than Star Factory. More new sections for the tower cranes have been arriving and the second of four tower cranes has now risen to aid in the construction of Gigabay's third level. Once built, we expect it'll have five levels total, plus a roof for a total height of about 115 meters or about 375 feet. Gigabay also appears as if it'll have access doors to the east side of the facility and the rear of the building in the future. The side doors are facing Star Factory, leading us to believe that the two will eventually be joined together. These doors would serve as access for barrel sections and other components to go seamlessly from Star Factory into Gigabay. Work has also started for one of the rear doors. These will be facing the current mega bays and will allow access to the Gigabay from the ring yard. It wouldn't be surprising if in the future these doors were also connected to Star Factory in some fashion, but that is much farther down the line, it seems. Time for our McGregor Minute, where we're taking a look at the progress of Raptor and Merlin engine testing at SpaceX's test facility in Central Texas. In the past week, SpaceX has carried out 16 Raptor tests total. Strangely though, none of which took place from the Raptor South Stand and only one occurred from the Raptor North Stand. As a reminder, these two stands are sort of like twins, each fitted with two bays and are the most recent stands built at McGregor. While they had been more active in previous weeks, it's really strange to not see much activity here in the last few days. This means that 15 of the 16 tests this week all came from the only other remaining active stand, the Raptor Vertical Stand. Side note, technically all of these stands are vertical, but the Raptor Vertical Stand was the first that was actually vertical after SpaceX had tested Raptors only horizontally at the now retired Raptor Horizontal Stand. Of the 15 tests, two of them were of the same 115 second long burn that we have seen in the past, but a new and unfamiliar duration has been observed. Instead of 115 seconds, these were all roughly between 133 and 135 seconds in duration, and there were four such burns in the past week. The latter three were also followed by relay tests shortly after the main burns, perhaps simulating a different flight profile than before. We also saw relay testing with 20 second durations at the stand, which didn't seem to be related, or at least not obviously. Perhaps there's good reason why we haven't seen testing at the Raptor North or South stands. Over the last few weeks, teams have been upgrading systems here and most recently we saw a vertical stand installed at Raptor North. We also saw a Raptor 3 vacuum engine that wasn't serial number 8 for the first time. This was serial number 77, and it went to the Raptor South stand. Maybe the fact that we didn't see tests here this week was because they were preparing for a new round of RVAC testing with a brand new engine. Quick side note, don't get confused by the fact that this RVAC has serial number 77. It doesn't mean it's the 77th RVAC engine built, it just means it's the 77th Raptor 3 engine overall. SpaceX only used different numbers for the Raptor 1 engines, but beginning with Raptor 2, all engines, either sea level or vacuum optimized, share the same number pattern, which makes tracking a lot easier. Oh, and that engine in particular wasn't the only one we observed. We yet again spotted Raptor number 4, which was being moved around by a Cybertruck. We're often asked why SpaceX doesn't use one of these for transporting engines around McGregor, and... well, I guess they do now. SpaceX definitely has a lot of Cybertrucks around various facilities, and we have recently seen a few of them being utilized for more fun purposes. This past Friday, SpaceX performed their traditional holiday parade down Highway 4, and there were a few Cybertrucks, SPMTs, and floats included. For example, Mechazella was holding a booster and the comeback of the saluting snowman. Recall when these were used all the way back at the end of 2023 getting ready for Starship Flight 3? We sure do, because... Starbase Live never forgets. Now folks, as we're approaching the end of the year, this will be our last Starbase update for 2025. But we'll be back with a whole lot more to cover in the new year, as you all know just as much as we do, that SpaceX and Starbase do not sleep. And you can bet that there will be a lot to cover when we return. Thank you so much for watching this year, and we hope you have a wonderful new year. A Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever you may celebrate. And I will catch you guys in the next one. Until then, Peace out, Girl Scouts.